old. I'm Al Fry, and this is the first in a series of strange phenomena in the history of the West presentations. And in it, I'm going to reminisce a little bit and cover some ground that you won't find in the usual books or movies. And I'll show you places that have been well kept secrets up to now. And to begin with, let's mention one of the strangest encounters. I ever had out in the high country around Joshua Tree, California. And it was up in the high desert region there that I met the girl I'd call Myrtle Reese. The most unusual woman I've met in many ways. Myrtle was evidently a high and favored person to many other dimensional entities of the desert and over the next several years that I visited with her and knew her, I was drawn into a world that was more like fantasy than fact. And I should add at this point that I'm rather skeptical of psychics and other dimensional spirits and visions, yet I repeatedly took other psychic friends to visit with Myrtle and Almost invariably, they confirmed many of her views on the local nature spirits and the ancient ruins in the area that she often mentioned and showed me. What probably astonished me more than anything was the fact that there was a small tribe of what she called hobbits near the Joshua Tree National Monument. And these little other dimensional people were somewhat similar in appearance to dwarfs, and they stood less than four feet tall. And they evidently copied much of our present technology, if it suited them. And they simply did my mental creation, I assume. And several times, she and others mentioned small other dimensional saucer craft that they enjoyed speeding around the desert in. Well, according to Myrtle, she first encountered these little hobbits near the Mount Shasta area in Northern California. And it seems that the little hobbits' leaders said that the vibrations in the area were changing radically, and so they moved to the south into the high desert near Joshua Tree. Myrtle had become a great influence and aid in their life by this time, and she decided to move southward with them. So while her husband found work in the Joshua Tree area, she spent much of her nightlife going in and out of the lower nether world, as they call it, and part of her days mediating for the little people of the area. And when I was with her, she'd often mention the various local hobbits and other dimensional gods and personages by name. She evidently worked in the lower astral or nether worlds, trying to get lost and misguided souls back to a higher plane in the other world existences there. Well, not being particularly psychic or blessed with the ability to see the less dense matter in atoms, I couldn't see her hobbits in the area. But I remember friends who could, however, and the encounters we had showed that the hobbits were very shy and prone to be suspicious of we humans, as they called us. I remember once a little hobbit youngster came out shyly up to a girlfriend that I was with, and they carried on a little conversation while I sat on and looked on beside her. Well, Myrtle constantly mentioned J.R.R. Tolkien, the popular fantasy writer who wrote of ancient hobbits. According to Myrtle, he obtained much of the material for his Lord of the Ring books from ancient manuscripts in the British Museum with some ability to tap his ancient soul knowledge and a little imagination, his books, she claimed, were quite accurate. Well, Tolkien, you might recall, set down the history of the ancient world in the appendix at the end of his trilogy. 
then, The Fellowship of the Ring was the last part of this trilogy with this appendix in it. Appendix A, for example, tells of the God Kings who came from the stars originally and broke up into two factions. Those who wished to rule the world ruthlessly and those who granted choice and freedom to all beings here on the planet. Well, the great Eldar ruled with wisdom for a time, but the dark lords like Morgoth eventually stole some of the great power source jewels, or Atlantean starfire crystals as some persons know them as. And in the war against evil, several classes of men or Hopo sapiens sided with the Eldar. And it was these epic battles that Tolkien first wrote of in his books. And in the Silmarillion, the history of various forms of humanoids and god life was continued. And some of the lords of the light left our planet. Some classes of being like the elves chose to leave the physical dimension and go into the next dimensions and some races disappeared altogether. And at the downfall of the ancient world, under the evil of lords like Suron, the Homo sapien species and other midwares, or the products of matings between gods and men, were given a certain amount of time to rule the world and to learn to become ethical, if we could. We had a chance then to become like the gods if we could get our act together and balance our various minds. And Tolkien goes into great detail in his index and the various, various races, their peculiarities. He examines them in minute details. Well, the majority of the world's humans are too caught up in the various domination systems and false histories of our rulers to ever accept such concepts as reality, of course. And Tolkien was compelled to keep his writings capped under the fiction label to aid their general acceptance. And as you view and examine his and similar works, however, you'll find that the Bible and most of the ancient legends and traditions are very close in their broad outline of this good and evil scenario. Well, the planet has had a number of pole shifts or great cataclysms since the time of Tolkien's Middle Earth. And because of the great walls of water, rushing across the face of the planet, most of the monuments and buildings of ancient times are buried far under the debris of time and catastrophes. There are a few solid rock fortifications of the ancient cultures. And Myrtle Reese was fond of pointing out a few examples that were near here in this high desert area. I was once very surprised when she tossed down a map of the southwestern United States and began to compare it for me to the map provided in Tolkien's books. And the lush valleys of mid-earth were now filled with huge collections of silt, sand, and rock, yet the mountains still stood as they did in the times of old, as you can see by this map overlay. And later we can examine some of the sights and scenes that are still preserved from this ancient time. One of the types of beings that was mentioned by Tolkien was the Ents, or tree-like beings. From what I could gather, these Ents were akin to a cross between animal and vegetable and simply couldn't compete with the faster and more versatile beings of our world and planet. Myrtle claimed that she'd found a couple of Ents, at least their souls, that were now existing in the Joshua tree form. And in conversations with them, 
She found a desert shrub resembling a white sage that was favored by the ants as a tea and mentioned in Tolkien's books on the hobbits. And I didn't care too much for the flavor, but the tea was very vitalizing according to her and the acquaintances that used it. Well, persons that are skeptical of all this and these views are reminded that the human has several components, one of which is alien to our planet and which runs the thinking of most persons most of the time. To it, the non-physical world is a sham because it doesn't show up on some measuring device or it was not within its intelligence. Well, psychics and others who can meditate their way out of this technology or priority thinking can often see the other wonders. The wonders of our world that are all around them. They're invisible to most persons and there is a fine line between fantasy and reality and it's a very true that truth is often at least as strange as fiction. Myrtle's home was just above a very ancient Numenorean living site and an enclosure that looked north over the east end of the Yucca Valley. And it was here that she was frequently visited by the other dimensionals of the area, including various hobbits and the old world lords. And as I visited her, I heard her mention John, Abraham, Eustace, Dag, Gadley, Gondok, Legales, Imharil, Abden, Zeppo, Arch, and others. And whether these gods were old dominion gods who were against a free choice system of light and the creator is a question I couldn't answer here. I never got to meet them. Eastern teachings usually go more deeply into this area and we touch on it elsewhere. Myrtle and many other astral travelers run across constructs or identities in the other dimension that are gross and ugly in the lower planes. And these were the planes that she worked in because the few others could stand the pressure. What she and Tolkien called the hobbits, of course, were often called goblins and dwarfs and other names in other cultures. Here are some goblins according to European standards and artists. Many artists, of course, actually see the creatures that they create on paper. There have been numerous accounts that have come from persons who encountered little creatures and beings in underground caverns and such. And Tolkien touches on this. Originally, the old gods of old bred a race of dwarfs so they could work in their minds more efficiently. There are many old manuscripts on calling up the demons and nature spirits to aid in changing circumstances. And there's a certain amount of truth to this, but as has been pointed out, it's often very dangerous business. And the world is full of domination now, and this has always caused chaos here and in the past. And Tolkien's works often chronicle the rise and fall of men, gods, and other earth life thousands of years ago with this chaos and domination systems that are always replaced. Well, Myrtle and others who could connect with the past to some degree only confirm the futility of the Dominion systems in the past and present, and I've spoken with persons who've seen great armies of the past marching across the high desert, recreating these past events over 8,000 years ago. Armies pitted against one another, just as they are at present. I also found it very interesting that Myrtle could see the great clouds of negative en energy slowly floating from the Los Angeles Basin to the great grounding areas near her there. Some of these resemble dragons and other negative forms due to the negativity of the human thoughts in the large city areas. And each time that I was out in the desert overnight in this area, I could see the smaller UFOs darting about sooner or later. 
little specks of light would show up as the larger mother craft opened their doors and ejected the smaller craft from great heights. And we were usually able to see them in the desert because the skies were clear in these areas out there. From reports of ancient rulers and records, certain watchers have been observing our species and such craft for thousands of years. And the Numenorean humanoids that once existed in the ruins will view a little later to the ruins of present. And they were a step above what we think the caveman was. But even a few steps above the caveman, they still had very little technology to make life easy. And there are very few artifacts of them that still exist. Well, the upper local tribes of the Middle Earth period in the upper desert areas would hold off invaders from crude rock fortifications there. And these were usually at higher elevations than the surrounding territory and they resembled very crude forts using the natural rocks available as we'll see later. The weapons like spears and knives were in use for those who could afford them yet few persons of the time could gather much more than the bare essentials of life. And there were higher cultures in some part of the world, but most of humanity didn't want to get involved for the most part. The great moguls and rulers, then as now, were fond of putting go-getters in harness for their own use. Remote poverty was better than civilized slavery for vast majority. The high desert tribes that built the stonework forts that we'll see later were a couple of feet taller than today's humanoids. Could wrestle the rocks around a little easier. And many smaller races, of course, existed at the same time, just as Tolkien's work explains. Large families were favored as it guaranteed better insurance that the father or leader would have greater power and an old age survival. And the great beasts existed far beyond the date currently set by archaeologists, and this is another subject touched on elsewhere. Foraging for plants and wild seeds brought on a large part of the menu of the high desert dwellers. If you ever want to know how simple it was to live off the land and nature's bounty, you can read the life of Ishi, the last of a remote California Indian tribe. Very famous, many books written on him. He lived quite well by his wits, only a few years back. In the high desert area cultures built communal forts as a rule in the Joshua area, yet other natives on the American continent favored solitary rock and wood houses like these from Latin America. The later Indians, of course, had less permanent dwellings. Some of the Latin cultures, like the Mayas, had hundreds of miles of watering canals, irrigation canals, to help them produce food. And this is from a recent space photo with a special lens. And other similar canals have come to light around Phoenix, Arizona, and other areas of the United States. Well, Myrtle Reese, the human friend of the hobbits, is now gone. And I'm not aware of any replacements for her in the area she was in. And the little people, though, still exist in the area. And they're occasionally seen. And if you doubt this, just head out to the area we're going to show you here and see for yourself. If your sight isn't up to seeing in the psychic world, take along a psychic friend. And you just may very well be surprised at what you run across out there. Now, uh, let's take a first-hand run. We're going out past Palm Springs, going toward India. We turn left up toward Yucca Valley. We're going down and watching the windmills work along the way. 
And we see Mount San Jacinto in the background, and Palm Springs in the distance. And we're going to head north now, going up to mental physics, and bypass Yucca Valley about a mile here. And this is mental physics, which is a landmark we need to know about because we're going up on a dirt road about a mile south of this landmark. We're going up into this ridge area. This is the old ancient fortification. And I can't remember the exact name in Tolkien's book that this was called, but this was a famous fortification in Tolkien's book. This is a high little knoll. It was like a fort in ancient times where the Numenorean tribes lived here. This is very difficult to tell. Six, eight thousand years of rubble. We've had major floods and such, but you can see the walls to some degree back of us here. They had built walls because they were eight, nine foot beings that lifted some of these rocks and built the rocks, walls that you see here. It's very difficult to see in a picture like this where these wall demarcations are. But if you look carefully, you'll see where the rubble of the rocks, walls, is. The whole area is full of this type of thing, and it's difficult to tell where these are. And right in the center of this picture, we'll, it's going off to the right, you'll see the rock wall there. And they would use wood and stone to build their huts, kind of communal fort-like fortifications here. Now we're up on top of this little ridge, this little fortification, looking down northward. Mental physics is way in the background, just near the highway there. We're looking off of this little fortification. We're sweeping around eastward, taking a view eastward toward Joshua Tree National Monument, which you must go through if you're out in this area, and you'll see many other rock formations like these. What if? You're with a psychic who can pick up on the vibrations of the past, you'll find out where the civilizations and settlements were, because many of these rock stonework areas of fortifications like this are similar. Now we're going to run from this area near Yucca Valley and head north to one of the most controversial projects ever started in this part of the country. And the Integraton Rejuvenation Machine, as it was called, was started in the mid-50s by George Van Tassel, who you see here. And this giant dome, when finished, was supposed to be able to rejuvenate to the human body. Well, for a number of years, no one ever saw the inside of this structure while it was being built. Several documentaries covered the structure in the 70s, 80s, but Van Tassel slowed down the construction and finally passed away in 1978. Originally, Van Tassel was contacted by space beings, according to him, who gave him instructions. And in this picture, you see him beside his model of the Integraton. It's an all-wood building, which, when this picture was taken in 74, was 85% complete, according to him. And Tassel was noted for his giant rock airport in the 1950s. And here's a flying saucer convention crowd at the annual gatherings at this airport in the late 50s. And below you see the map of how to get to the area. And we'll go into all of this later and show you how it appears today in 1986. Now I began going to these conventions in the 60s. And I used to go under the giant rock there to view some of the paraphernalia and books and such that Van Tassel had put under a little room under the rock, the giant rock. And supposedly, the giant rock room was built by a suspected Nazi named Frank Kritzner, who dug the room back in the 40s. And then George bought the land, built a restaurant on the property, and had an airport, which we'll view later. Well, George spent thousands of dollars on this 55-foot dome generator out in the desert, and 
It worked on a principle that was similar to that used by Lekonsky in his multi-wave oscillator. It was, should have been able to treat 10,000 persons a day if it were successful, controlling the resonance and polarity and reversal interruptions, the machine was supposed to create a common core flux from these split fields and thus a time zone. The device combined at a feel of soft high frequency radio waves, magnetism and a negative charged atmosphere. Now what you see here is the Integraton 2 by William F. Hamilton in the 84 who redesigned the machine, updated it somewhat, and here you see A, the electrostatic drive motor and the generator rotor configuration, C, the collector plates, D, computer control room, E, the Tesla coil right in the center. We'll see another Tesla coil being built in 1986, a short time up a little later on in this presentation. And we have F, the atmospheric collector for trapping the Earth's potential up high, like an aerial. H, the entry anteroom humidity report. Now, Van Tassel stated that through control of resonance and polarity reversal interruptions that the common core flux would create a time zone, as we mentioned. And by giving an oscillatory shock to the coils of the body simultaneously via dampened electrostatic waves, injurious thermal effects on cells could be avoided and all of the multiple wavelengths produced by his device would tune every cell and every nerve and every organ in the body. And this particular pictorial was done in the Borderline Research Foundation Journal, Box 549, Vista, California. And this particular Integraton design was not too far different from the design thousands of years ago from Moses' time, where the children of Israel would pitch the tent and run the Ark of the Covenant, if you'll remember. The Ark of Moses was actually designed to rejuvenate persons of high ethical and affection standards. Others who came near it would be destroyed. The neuro circuits of the human who came near it would have to hit, switch to a high oxygen-based level or the current would burn out the metallic brain neurons. Switching took far more control than most persons had, and there are hundreds of persons died from the Ark of the Covenant getting too close to it. And how did it work? Well, it worked by the badger skins and fur hides rubbing together. And they had a coating of metallic content, and rubbing together they created static electricity. The static electricity would run down the gold-plated or it would go down the gold leaf poles in the temple and would run through to the Ark of the Covenant, which acted as a condenser. And they would put their sacrifices and such between the angel wings. Do you remember in Leviticus 10.2? says there went out fire from before the Lord, and they died before the Lord. This is the death of uh, Nabab and Abihu. Well, much of this information, of course, is in the Bible, but there is some that isn't. In the old Jewish manuscripts, you'll find that the badger sins and such were coated with metallic salts, and this is not in the Bible. Many persons don't realize that the Ark of the Covenant was also a rejuvenation machine. And there were records in early civilizations such as Atlantis mentioning the larger rejuvenation machines using crystals and kinetic energy, as in the case of the Integraton and the Ark of the Covenant. There are a number of persons who have the information on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. It's not really a secret information. And we're mentioning it because it's so close to Van Tassel's machine in the desert. And here you see the tent material, red and purple linen, outside woven goat hair, badger skins, ram skins, and dyed red. 
purple linen, and all of them impregnated with metallic compounds. And here you see some of the uh, measurements. And of course, the information's in Exodus, Numbers, and Joshua. Today's cost of gold, it would cost at least a million dollars in precious metals and materials to build another Ark of the Covenant. Van Tassel's little project cost hundreds of thousands. So let's now turn from the old original Ark to a new design. plans and, uh, and the ability to work and uh, help me get to whatever it is that they know to get this going and they're willing to put their, mo their money where their mouth is, man, I'll be here to help them. Now, I understand, uh, Don, that all of this was built without nails. Is that well, that's true? That's true. So there is no nails, and you, if you photograph this floor right here, you can see where the pegs are. Right in here is the sound effects. There are approximately three rings, concentric rings of sound. And if you walk through here, you can hear them. And if, if this person will walk with me, I know that he's a very spiritual person. He probably does homes and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, if we do it together, you walk through here, you may hear a different sound when you're doing homes. And I can do it. And if you, if you stand there, you can hear the difference. But if you have two people going together, he sounds even better. <clears throat> so you want to do it out? You have to care about the big sound. Oh! Yes. 
Latinx stuff. The reason this is, is they use a process like this down in Mexico, where they call the ball courts, where they have the hole. They call the ball courts, they were in the ball courts, because if you went around the other side and see the barrels, it showed something else. But somebody was beside the ball courts and left the field ball. It has something to do with the healing process. And uh, if this works, we're not going to tell anybody to get healed. They'll be able to get healed. I have to tell them now. I'm sure they're going to recommend it. So that'll get in trouble with the law here. Do uh, understand Tesla and Steinmetz probably better than anyone in the world that I know of. I've never seen that. Uh, I just think he's that wonderful. Uh, he will probably be wiring the bottom of this. Now, I do not know if this is going to go together, but if, if this is truly an arrangement of the Space Brothers, and according to it was, I've never had any contact with them coming by and uh, leaving any other known bill to help me. But if they do, I'll say, well, I'll just say, what plan do you call? I don't, I don't care what plan you I'm glad you got here. <laughs> so, <laughs> if we can get this project going, I think that, I don't know exactly what's worth, but I believe it's, it's the whole mental structure of this century. I think it's one of the seven wonders of the world. And I truly believe that it may have had something to do with the angels and the God and all of this stuff. I really believe it had something to do with it. I can't prove it. And uh, any more than the Ark of the Covenant they had from the old days. I have always wondered, Lord, what happened to our covenant? It's such a great and valuable piece of equipment. And uh, the Hebrews and the people who traveled from the desert had it. But what did they do with it? Did they sell it for the bar and garage sale or what? I always wondered what happened. You know, I am getting a strange bunch of, uh, of vertic uh, ver vertical lines on my camera here. I wonder if that'll show up because right through the top, there are vertical lines. That has nothing to do with the window. Well, I'm going to tell you something. has nothing to do with the lay lines. The lay lines here are so strong that these lay lines meet right here across the cross the lay lines. The lay lines run from here out here. From this way, they run approximately uh, 12 to 16 feet intermittently, every other one. And from this way, they lie 8 to 10. And they're just like, they're just like lay lines. They're just like a dollar that can pick up on them. And they're just like water lines. Well, how far do they extend from... Well, you can take them right away from here. They, they go from here. This is just a heavy, heavy, heavy spot of them. For some reason, I don't know why. You've traced them for what? Quarter of a mile or just oh, a no, thousand I feet? Oh, no, quarter of a mile. Just from out here on the other side of the fence. Oh, I see. Guy, I was trying to get the guy to find a water line for oh. me. And he said, well, there's one here. And he said, there's one here. And I said, there's no water line here. And he kept on going, and they come all, all, all the way in. They just, and then right around the way of the building, they said, there's one. And then there's another one inside, or there's one in between. But they, on both sides, the lay lines come out where they write on the right on the concrete. I'm going back to check on the word back in Ohio, and he has something there that says the word. The word probably is not how it works. How long have you had this, Don? Uh, 1979. Oh. I understand. It had a sign on it that uh, mentioned that the U.S. Navy was involved or something. Is that just for a while? And she had any connection? I've heard rumors about that. I, the rumors I can just count them right fast. I, I heard stories like that. I don't know these trusses. And uh, I indeed that uh, this place this place will have in a process. Understand was a kinetic energy collector. Is this basically what this is about? And are you going to just hook it up to a power line and, and uh, stuff it full of well, I can kinetic? Say this, sir, that if, they, if you 
was necessary to connect to a power line, and the Israelites here was carrying this ark to come around didn't have any power line to connect on. So God had to put a, a temporary special high pressure line in uh, in order to get it to work out there in the desert. So we're out of there, we don't have any high pressure line, we'll just have to let it see what it's going to be raining. So and you're the spaceships can send out a beam <laughs> far <in> this. <laughs> We're walking over the center, and you'll notice the difference in the sound range. And now we're going to leave the Integraton. I'm going to head north, northeast, for a few miles to go to the site of the famed flying saucer conventions that were held in the earlier days by George Van Tassel. And just before we go, we're going to see Don's Tesla coils, gigantic Tesla coils that he'll use in his Integraton. We have to, that, you know, they'll put in, you know, this will go into the wood, like the tree of life. And what you see here is the Tesla coil burning a design in the wood. And the equipment used to run and design more Integraton machinery. Yeah, the high frequency Tesla device. This is a this is a Tesla this is a Tesla rig. A genuine works. I see Eric is doing something. I built those yesterday. I did See, I see this one here. I yeah. painted. I took the gut out of that one. See the gut there? And I made this one from here. See, it's all non-metallic stuff. There's no wood on it. It cuts it's down. like you overcome a vacuum and makes it go the other way rather than the vacuum. See that? That's why both burn good. They're in vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what they pop here. Implode. Mm -hmm. When we mess with this, we get explosions instead of implosions. Now we're going to leave the Integraton. This is looking eastward. Now we're looking southward from the Integraton on the road coming in. We've gone slightly further now, and we're going into the site of the old flying saucer convention at Giant Rock. And here you see the foundation of what was once Fantastic Restaurant. Here's Giant Rock itself, which had the small underground lair on the other side that I used to go into. It's full of books for Van Tassels. And we're swinging eastward now. From Giant Rock, we're swinging southward. You'll see the landing strip, Giant Rock Airport. Van Tassel had many planes coming here to visit him, and especially once a year at the Flying Saucer Conventions, which were a lot of fun, believe me. My particular little desert bug there, and now we're coming out the main highway, and this is where you turn right after you get about 14 miles north of Yucca Valley, and you'll see the mountain in the background, the small hill there, and the Integraton is near that. Now we're swinging north, we're cutting back to Yucca Valley. This is the town of Yucca Valley, where you turn left, go north, up this road, about 14 miles to the turnoff to the Integraton. Now we're looking southward through Morongo Valley Road. We're heading down to Palm Springs. And you'll see all of the windmills along the way. A beautiful sight, hundreds and hundreds of windmills. The largest collection of windmills probably in the world at this time. Breezes are always blowing in this area. Winds are always howling through here. Mount San Jacinto in the background. A bit smoggy this day. This is a white water river. Runs for 15 or 20 miles down from the Big Bear mountain areas, San Bernardino Mountains. South, Mount San Jacinto, there's Palm Springs cut in the distance more windmills and the whitewater river runs like this all year long a great amount of fun swimming in it and the dinosaurs you'll pass on the right toward los angeles again going home two dinosaurs now one of them has a little snock shop souvenir shop in it very interesting and we'll also go by the indian bingo parlor 
which is north of the highway going back to Los Angeles. Before we get to Los Angeles, we're going to swing left for another surprise. Let's cut down south toward San Diego. We'll stop off at Escondido and turn right and about five miles westward and we'll come to Harmony Grove where the strange rocks have writings that's embedded deeply far older than Indian writings in any place in the western United States. These ancient symbolic writings have been thought to be Indian writings by scientists. But according to the psychics, they're far more. They're actually deep etchings of ancient machinery, diagrams from machines at least 8,000 years old, machine that was once used to try to get off the planet by trapped aliens, exiles placed on Earth who use this power center. It's a famous power center in Harmony Grove. It'll make the hair on your arms stand up when you go in this area, if you're sensitive at all. Let's turn now to some of the rock writings of as of 1986, and we'll show you how to get to this area and some of the interesting features of this area. Keep in mind when you see these that someone has used chalk to fill in the indentations where the rocks have been chiseled or deeply engraved with some sort of cutting device, like a laser device. Far more intricate than anything the Indians ever did on our continent. And there are a number of other in deeper writings such as this in the western United States. And as I say, this is an energy point, one of the major energy points of the western United States. And the Indians call this their sacred spot and knew of it and today the spiritualists have a spiritualist camp at the site. We're going to show you exactly how to get to these writings, because not very many people know about them or how to get to them. You see that vandals have broken some of them, chipped them off. We're facing now eastward, and we're in a small saddle overlooking Harmony Grove, giving you some idea of the size of these rocks as Will sits on the head of the rocks here. Blue chalk outlining the indentations and engravings here. Beautiful flowers this time of year. And if you ever get up here, you'll enjoy this immensely. Heavily wooded, many, many wildflowers. Looking eastward again. Two major sets of writings. And beautiful flowers all over most of the year. In the background, you see the quarry facing eastward. We're going northward now to show you the phone lines on the hill. Now we're facing south, looking at the road in from the south. There are two major ways in this area. And this one's running north. We're going up, turning now eastward. And right up in that saddle, you see, in the center of this picture, are the rock writings. And the way you get up, as you follow the river road down to where you see this gap. And you go through this gap, which we saw just leads up into the little draw. This is looking westward down the road, following the river, the drainage river to the Escondido area. Now we're looking eastward, sitting up on the rock area, the little saddle. Now we're looking right down into Harmony Grove at the trees in the bottom of this shot. It's a little farming community, and the little cabins for Harmony Groves are centered in those trees that you see down at the bottom of this. 
Now we're going southward and looking at the little saddle. And the rock writings are in the center of this picture, where the little bald spot was. There's a quarry, one of the most unusual quarries in the country, right down at the bottom of this, looking eastward. We're swinging it down now again, looking at Harmony Grove itself at the bottom of our hill here. The little saddle. And we'll get more shots as we go along here, so you'll know exactly where this is located. Again, that little white patch in the center of the picture is where the rock writings are. Now, there is a back way in this, a north entrance, so to speak. And this is how you get there. There's a little saddle northward that you come around about two miles, coming in from the north, and you go up this little saddle here, and the rock writings are off to the left where we're facing now. And how you get here is off of Harmony Grove Road, and you turn right at Wygen Road here. Go up to some private residences, keep going, and you'll twist around the hill, and you'll have landmarks like this showing you how to get on the top. And this is Harmony Grove Chapel. We'll show you pictures of Harmony Grove here. Very interesting area. Many spiritualists live here. If you come in on Sunday, they'll have services, healing services. You have the, the visitor's entrance section here, and many little cabins that you can rent for a weekend or a day or however long you'd like to stay. little parking area here. Many, many cabins here. Witch's Hollow, it was called at one time. Most of the persons in Escondido know about this area. Harmony Grove. You come down Harmony Grove Lane. Come out 9th Street, coming from Escondido, and you'll hit Harmony Grove Lane, coming westward. And you see the sun going over and sitting above this little saddle. We're right in the middle of Harmony Grove here, and you can't miss those rock writings because you'll just follow the sun in the evening. And you look up on the ridge, and there is the area. Very few people, unfortunately, know about these rock writings or what they represent. And many people in the area just refer to them as the Indian writings. Many of them know about the Indian writings. But there's far more to the tale, and we've given you about 80% of the knowledge that's available as to the origin of these unique ancient writings. And here you see the visitors area as you come into Harmony Grove. Very unique people living here. Many of them are see other dimensional spirits and are psychics and very wonderful people. They have their little worshiping temples here and little Sunday services which are very interesting to go to because they do have the healing as we mentioned. Here's a little cafeteria that they had going for a while. The time I was here, they were being harassed by the county. These little tiny cabins here weren't quite up to code. And of course, we all know what that means, more harassment. Grounds are kept spotless. Beautiful little area, very inexpensive place to rent a cabin for a short time. And if you are ever in Southern California, this would be one of the places to visit. And again, we're looking up. And before we leave this area, one last look at the sun going down in the west over the little saddle looking westward from Harmony Grove. See the sun peeking over the little saddle. Very unique, wonderful area. Another little surprise in California. California is full of little surprises like this. And we'll go on more little adventures as we go through. Well, the largest concentration of power or energy vortexes in the United States is located in the Red Rock country of central Arizona. And there are at least 
15 different vortexes in this area of varying intensity and vibratory polarity. And some of these power spots have affected many persons who visited them in an uplifting way. The Boynton Canyon vortex is probably the largest and most powerful of this group and an electromagnetic female polarity. And the Indians consider it to be the home of their female or mother energy on Earth. Each of the other vortexes has an electrical or a magnetic energy effect and a male or a female polarity. This means that each person is affected very differently as a result of this. There have usually been many tour guides in the area that have known these different vortex areas intimately. And these listings can be found from the Chamber of Commerce. On this map, you're facing north. And you can see where you cut off into downtown and the Chamber of Commerce building off of Highway 89. Boynton Canyon is off of 89. Dry Creek Road at the upper left of this picture. And in other major vortexes, the polarity is different and there are varying intensities. And you can see these on this map outlined in red. The lower left, the Cathedral Rock area, and the Airport Road vortex in the center the post office vortex in the right center, the devil's kitchen to the right, in the lower right, the bell rock, and the Oak Creek Canyon vortex or near Indian Gardens in the upper right. Well, aside from the many vortexes in the west, there's another phenomena that we very seldom hear of. And throughout the West, the so-called phantom hitchhikers have occasionally taken rides and perplexed many drivers all over the West. Well, as I live in Southern California, I've had several friends tell me of their experiences with phantom hitchhikers. One woman who was a devout Christian and a woman that would never Tell a lie told me that she'd picked up two such hitchhikers on Highway 15 just north of Paris. Both had vanished the moment she let them out of the car. This was in the 1960s, but such phenomena has been occurring for years. In a 1942 folklore quarterly magazine, two researchers collected 179 stories of variations of the vanishing hitchhikers. There are many periodicals like Fate magazine that regularly run such articles and several books have covered the subject if you're interested. Well, it's the human mind that can borrow energy from the body, kinetic energy, and throw it out to make holograms. And this is a subject that's covered elsewhere. The origin of these phantom hitchhikers then and the phenomena like the phantom armies that we've mentioned previously are not all that mysterious to understand if you understand the kinetic energy theories here. A vast body and group of men like this on a war campaign would throw out great deal of kinetic energy and later through the years under the same conditions this kinetic energy would regroup and reprogram bring about the same conditions again the case of phantom hitchhikers of course the human mind can send out kinetic energy to bring in such pictures Mystery schools, of course, sometimes have students do this in a mirror. 
mind projects to the brain the view it wants to project. The origin in these of the other phenomena of the phantom armies and humans previously mentioned are not all that mysterious to understand. And this, of course, is touched on in other presentations. Well, there are many other strange phenomena that's occurring off and on in the West. A typical example was run in the Seattle Times, November 22nd, 1984 tells about a three-ton geological puzzle. Somehow, in a way that baffles geologists, a massive chunk of earth, 10 feet long and 7 feet wide, was plucked from this remote plateau in north central Washington and put down right side up 70 feet away. There's no evidence that humans had anything to do with this. No equipment was in the area. And this is a diagram and a picture ran in this article in 1984. This event took place above Grand Coulee Dam off of 155. And it was in a plateau. It's around 2,360 feet above sea level. It's in a small hollow, probably scraped out in the plateau's bedrock by an ice sheet thousands of years ago. No one to this date has come up with a plausible explanation. Now, aside from the strange earth phenomena, there have been a number of strange animals in the American West. The most feared and dangerous animal of all was not the bear or the cougar. It was this little diminutive wolverine. The trappers and Indians called them the evil ones or the Indian devils. They often played fiendish games on the solitary trappers of the early West. They could follow a trapper and continually trip the traps and eat the bait or the trapped animals and just ignore the poisons and traps set for them. And there are many tales of mutilations and deaths caused by these carayous or skunk bears told by Indians and frontiersmen alike in the early West. And today, of course, these deadly animals are only found in the far north country. Another phenomena that's never taught in the history books, the phenomena of the giants of the West who roamed over the very early Americas and was quite well known to the Indians. In 1833, a detail of soldiers, for example, were digging a powder magazine foundation near Lompoc Ranchero in California, and they discovered a stone coffin and a 12-foot tall skeleton. The local Indians told authorities that this was one of the old Albuquerque giants that once occupied the American continent before the Indians. The Indians eventually exterminated them. According to the legends, the folklore, and the documents of the Indians. In this case, a local priest from a Spanish mission reburied the bones because Indian unrest over the incident. And the Paiutes of Nevada particularly hated the last remnants of these giants. They called them the Sitaka. They still have traditions of long and bloody battles with these red-haired giants of earlier times. And there are several other western tribes that confirm that eventually these giants were decimated by the superior numbers of the Indians. And the last of the giants were driven into the Shasta Lake and Mount Shasta area where they eventually died off according to the legends. It's interesting to remember that the Indians of the East Coast say that the mound builders of the early Americas were giants, and only the Indians involved in building these giant mounds were slave laborers, which the giants rounded up. And these Indians hated the giants. 
And there are many, many records of such traditions scattered all over the archives of the East Coast. They indicate that hundreds of thousands of these white-skinned giants once ruled the Americas. And there's much other evidence. The Chinese Shanghai King geography book of 2250 BC tells of a survey team visiting North America and finding giant artifacts here. And earlier literature tells of giants living in this land. The Incas were once invaded by these giants, according to their record. They came out of North America. This was according to the history written by the last Incan prince. Plato and one of his students both wrote of the giants of a distant western country. And other western finds which authenticate giants include an 1877 discovery of bones of a giant near Eureka, Nevada, and the discovery of a 12-foot skeleton 50 miles southeast of Tucson, and an enormous skull and bones near Lovelock, Nevada. In 1911, a guano mine near Lovelock produced several skeletons. And later in 1931, other bones were found in an area bound up like mummies in the area. There have been a number of articles published in the Western papers, particularly around Lovelock, Nevada, by the Times Post Service in the 1960s. Charles Hillinger published articles on the red-haired giants that were supposedly ran through the West in the early days. And according to Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins in the articles, she reported that the last of the giants were exterminated by her people in the early 19th century. A small tribe of barbarians used to waylay my people, she said, and eat them. Wrote the daughter of the old Winnemucca, the Paiute chief, after whom the town of Winnemucca, Nevada, was named. She said they would dig large holes in our trails at night and our people would fall into these holes. And that tribe would even eat their own dead. Yes, they would come and dig up our dead after they were buried. The Paiutes call these red-headed people the eaters. She said these large red-headed whiter Indian giants numbered about 2,600 when the Paiutes fought their three-year war, war, three war against them. And toward the end of the war, all that were left went into a cave. And they kept them in there. When they asked them if they would stop being cannibals and eating people like coyotes, the people gave no answer. And the giants evidently didn't want to cooperate with the Indians, and so they died in the cave. Well, uh, Clarence Stoker who was 69 years of old, the curator of Stoker's Museum in Winnemucca, has several bones and a skull on display back in the 60s. According to Stoker, these giants had a very advanced calendar with 365 dots on the outside of a stone calendar they had. And during the last 60 years, Scientific parties from the University of California at Berkeley have uncovered tons of artifacts and scores of mummies from the cave. And still, the public hears almost nothing about it today. There were evidently once hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these giants all across the Americas, ranging anywhere from 6 to 8 to 12 feet. Later, the Indians slowly decimated them because they could not live among the Indians without capturing and putting them to work and warring with them. And since there were more Indians, of course, eventually the Indians won out, the smaller native tribes. Caves, where many of the mummies and skeletons have been dug up, have been tested for carbon-14 dating tests and show that as early as 2000 to 3000 B.C., There's activity in these caves. And as late as 1800 to 1850, there have evidently been 
some of the smaller giant tribes living in the area. Now where is all the evidence gone? Well, it's scattered since official historians don't recognize much of this. But there are occasional photographs that pop up, like this one. Now this is showing a nine-foot vault it was found in Yosemite Park in 1895. It contained the mummy of a giant woman and her child, probably 10 to 12 feet long. And the Awanichi Indians had long maintained that there were giants in this area in earlier times. And here was actual proof. And scientists in Los Angeles authenticated this find. But of course today, the proof is conveniently stuck away and only the pictures remain. There are many more of the giants in the Americas, of course, than Europe, but occasionally, Europe did produce small tribes of giants. And there are traditions all across Europe concerning the giant invasions. The remote bands of giants that evidently stayed in Europe and occasionally attacked the more civilized Europeans, as this picture shows. According to records in Mexico City, one exploration of the Spanish had a giant in his group. Spaniards when they tricked across the area of what is now Southern California in the desert region there. And I once knew a real estate sales office owner in Beaumont, California that discovered huge armored parts and axe heads in a cave in the desert where this particular giant evidently died. And this is fact, it isn't fiction. I was there. As we point out, much of the physical evidence can be found in Stoker's Museum in Winnemucca area, which has changed hands now, but can be tracked down. And the smoke-coated caves that we spoke of are 22 miles southwest of Lovelock. If you ever get up that way. Well, turning to other giants, you might mention the giants of the deep off the California coast. And a good example was cited by the Deepster, which is the vessel owned by Westinghouse. It was exploring the ocean at 6,000 feet in the San Diego trough. And suddenly a monster fish confronted it with eyes as big as dinner plates. And there were two sightings of such 30-foot or larger monsters in the early 80s. And what else is lurking at such depth is hard to speculate on. We may just find out in the near future. Besides the giant humanoids and sea creatures and animals in the West, we've got giant birds. And according to a newspaper account of April 1890, a couple of cowboys ran into a huge bird-like creature in the barren desert regions near Tombstone. And after shooting it with rifles, they claimed the body was 92 feet and the bat-like wings were 160 feet long. And they arrived with a tip of a wing as proof. And the article mentioned a group was going to try to refine the carcass and bring it back, or at least the skin. And another early day example of a large bird was around in the Lake Elizabeth, California area. They evidently had a huge bird in that area living around the lake until the 1890s. And many ranchers and cowboys of the area saw it and tried to kill it before it made off with more of the rancher's cattle in the area. A rancher in the area sold out in the 1883 when he encountered it, and the next ranch buyer eventually shot at it from close quarters and described it as 45 feet long with an enormous wing and body and several pairs of legs. The Bigfoot, or Sasquatch as they're sometimes called, have been seen by hundreds of persons over a wider area of North America. They range from six to nine feet and weigh from 400 to 1,000 pounds. And there have been a number of articles, various newspapers and magazines, 
doctor from an examiner article out of San Francisco, July 15th, 1984. We see the typical Bigfoot country. These are prime Bigfoot hangouts in the northwestern part of California. A great deal of evidence to support the claims of Sasquatch, including photographs. And this is an actual photo of a small female taken by Roger Patterson with a 16 millimeter movie camera. Roger Patterson did considerable amount of searching in the northwestern California area before he got his picture. And here he's showing a comparison between his foot and an adult Sasquatch foot, plaster cast. And these other frames from Roger's photos show this particular female to be only about seven feet tall, the way in the neighborhood of 350 pounds. Well, even with evidence like this, many experts seeing these films comment about possible gorilla suits on a human. And so they go on to ignore the subject. And many of the experts try to convince others that the Yeti tracks are only from bear or other animals, yet there is a big difference. And the bear track below left is only a tiny fraction of the size of the Bigfoot and shaped completely different. And the same is true of the human foot above left and the gorilla at the far right. And if it's persons in gorilla suits, it's a lot of trouble to go to. And they're sticking their necks way out. And there are many, many articles around the West in the last 20 years on the Sasquatch. This is from the Sun. Vancouver, British Columbia, August 28, 84. Bill Bedry of the area described a creature that he took a photograph of as well over six feet, weighing about three to four hundred pounds, herring and running on its hind legs. At first he thought it looked like a bear, but then he said we got right up to it. I knew it wasn't a bear because I've killed bears and looked hairy and made a hell of a racket, he said. Big howling scream, I guess you'd call it, scared the hell out of us. He took three photos of the creature. And the news photographer in this case said he didn't publish the shots because they were a dark background and the object was dark and it wouldn't show up well in newsprint. And of course, many experts said another bear suit story. And in a August 28th article on the encounter by Bill Bedry, pointed out that a person would have to be crazy to dress up like a Sasquatch because he might get shot by a hunter. Well, the Hoopa Indians live in northwestern California and have a lot to say about the Sasquatch. And they have legends of them and other strange creatures in the woods, including the Kashwish, or the little people, which are two and a half foot tall, and who live in caves in the earth. And they believe that there are laws of the wild, and they must not be violated. Don't holler, throw rocks, or fish at more than one spot. Never carry a fish by the tail, and throw a meat away like a deer. Don't let animals suffer. And if you break these laws, the hoop laws believe that kishwish or little people will take hold of you, bring you bad luck, make you ill. Well, in an Examiner San Francisco article of July 21st, 1984, Jimmy Jackson, who's a Hoopla Indian, told about his experience as a child. The various Sasquatch and violations of the sacred laws of the land and nature. He told of having splitting headaches after he violated the rules of nature. And several times he had to consult 
was the woman shaman or the medicine woman who would clear up his headaches from his violations. Well, Indians, of course, don't try to photograph the Bigfoot. Only the interested white man does this. And here's a picture by Ivan Marks, who took this picture while a Sasquatch was taking a stroll. Very young animal. Used a movie camera with a tripod fitted with a telephoto lens and a 35 millimeter uh, camera hung around his neck. Waited at a watering hole until he caught this particular uh, animal. Many persons up in the Sasquatch country can find the tracks of the Sasquatch, and they're gigantic compared to those of a human. The Indians also speak very seldom of the Sasquatch because they've been laughed at so, ridiculed on the subject so often. And many examples. And this is an actual photograph of a Bigfoot. And we might add that they've been seen for years. An example, in 1884, a Canadian Pacific train crew captured a small Bigfoot. And this was confirmed by an elderly resident of the area in 1959. Then in 1924, a logger was kidnapped by a Bigfoot who tried to interest his daughter in Osman, was the man's name. And there are dozens of other strange first-person accounts that are easily found in the records and reports. And this article in the New York Post in 1985 by B. Pittman told of a Dr. Warren Cook, who was a college professor and stuck his neck way out by trying to validate the Sasquatch to his, to his fellow colleagues and the public in general. Well, the Siskiyou Mountains of Northern California are favorite haunts for the Sasquatch, and Willow Creek is a small town where this statue is taken. And many persons pass through this area of the country when they're looking for the Sasquatch. Well, further adventures with strange creatures of other areas of the world are presented in other presentations. Well, we've previously touched on some of the ancient ruins from ages bygone and how they were changed by the floods that came on the earth and periodically. We never mentioned that there are other ruins in the West. And here we have a picture of the Pinnacles National Monument rocks about 140 miles south of San Francisco. And it shows pre-deluge ruins and separate chambers of rooms of some sort, about half missing from each, and the walls dividing the chambers are actually 60 feet and more height, making the blocks out of which they were constructed correspondingly large, of course, and the whole affair being obviously beyond the capabilities of any primitive technology that we know today. The Indians in various parts of the West often have legends concerning some of the ancient ruins. We've already touched on the Sedona area, but we should go back because it's helpful that we mention that many of the Indians of this general Red Rock area and Four Corners area are taught that they are the descendants of ancient civilizations like Lumeria. And Lemuria, you might recall, was an older land mass even older than Atlantis. It was mentioned by numerous psychics like Edgar Cayce and others who could tap into the old Akishic records. It was Colonel James Churchward that wrote a number of books on the symbology used by the ancient Lemurians. And according to most accounts, there were various polar shifts or floods and the various tribes of Indians that were survivors of these floods came to the various areas of the West. And once the Four Corners area was said to be a part of this ancient Lemuria or Telos, 
and it was a tra trade center at that time. And some of the vortex energy points that we mentioned previously are thought to originate from these former civilization sites. Many psychics, for instance, have seen giant crystals still hidden under layers of debris in the Sedona area. In one seminar by Dick Sutphin, a well-known New Age teacher, 23 persons recognized ancient ruins buried in the area, while seven maintained that there were giant crystals still in the area affecting the Earth energies here. And while we're back in this Sedona area, I might mention that the Yang, or male energy, produced at the Bell Rock and airport mesa vortexes is effective to stimulate consciousness and the energies of the human body. And the female, or yin, vortexes at the Cathedral Rock allow persons to become more perceptive and intuitive since it affects the subconscious minds and not particularly the body. Now, the Boynton Canyon vortex is a combination of the yin and yang with an awesome power. Instead of in a small particular area this tremendous energy goes for almost a mile in diameter. It tends to not only invigorate persons physically, but it elevates their spiritual thoughts and past perceptions as well. There are always persons that scoff at this sort of thing unless they see something before their eyes. But the evidence is there in the fact that in space satellite photos, this is one of the few areas of the world that's free of smog, especially the United States, indicating that these huge amount of energy surfacing there are affecting the clouds above them. And when you're in the Boynton Canyon vortex, you should be able to feel the tremendous energy surging out of the ground here. Make the hair stand up on your arms if you're sensitive and can relax, feel it. Well, throughout the West, there are other vortex energy points, of course. And the Western states are rich in the lore of underground cavern entrances as well as the energy vortex areas. This is so-called portals for UFOs also. And here you see a map, the large circles being the main tunnel sites. Smaller circles, the reported entrances the little dots, the known caverns, and the squares, the suspected entrances, and dashes, the main tunnel system, supposedly, that interlink the main tunnel sites, the inner earth accesses. And there's another map showing the various vortex the areas noted for exotic happenings and the so-called portal entrances. It's published by the New Atlantean Journal back in 1980. Well, I've all already mentioned Mount Shasta, which is shown on this map you've just seen, and well known and as an area that's just full of exotic lore. Like most volcanic areas, it does have tunnels beneath it. And I'm aware of one just off the interstate highway north of there. Dozens of stories could be told of the strange beings seen in this area. Well, Mount Lassen, further to the south, has similar stories about it. And in one account, a couple of prospectors followed the tunnel for many, many miles until they came upon a race of people with advanced technology, evidently. Well, some portals are said to be protected by energy screens, which warp the visibility to ensure the privacy of these portals. Many stories concerning underground caverns and ruins take place in remote areas of the Southwest. 
and I once looked for the elusive river of gold just southwest of Las Vegas near Mountain Pass. I spent days wandering around little dead-end tunnels in the stalactites and stalagmites down in the bowels of the earth looking for a passageway, a passageway that would lead to eight miles of underground river was supposed to be filled with placer gravel worth a thousand dollars a square yard. Now, Culligan, the well-known bottled water czar, spent many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars projects like this, among which was tunneling toward this underground cavern. He never made it. And I found caverns which once led to the river, but as I say, time and exposure eventually blocked them, the deeper passages off. And the river is still down there to those who have an adventurous spirit. There may be some portal still open to this area. So now that you're interested, it's probably enough we should go a little deeper into this little story. We're coming from Los Angeles and we're going to Las Vegas and Mountain Pass is a high point right here where there's a large Mountain Pass mines. You're going up to Las Vegas, probably another 30 miles. Here's a little dirt road takes off to the left or the right here. And underground caverns go under the highway. And you see in this line here. And you go up here to the side of the peak you'll find a, an entrance to more shallow caves here. There been several articles on this. And this is Cocoa for Kessler Peak, in San Bernardino County that we just showed you here. And the Crystal Cave entrance is right in this area here. And you'll see it once you're in the area, this little door peak. And once you're on the side of Kessler Peak, almost to the top, there will be an entrance at this point. It may or may not have an iron grating over it. The ladder is coming down into the lower tunnel system with stalactites and stalagmites. Beautiful area, larger tunnel in here. The mud and silt have blocked the entrances in here, going down to the underground river quite a ways below. And this is Door Peak, which also has smaller caverns, more difficult, it's somewhat north of Cocoa Weave. And there was still a large cave which you could enter the last time I was there in the late 70s. This is a rather poor print of the opening near the top of Cocoa Weave Peak. And as I say, there have been some amount of money spent by individuals trying to get down through this area. The Cocoa Weave Peak again. A corporation was formed during the late 70s and the early 80s, who spent a great deal of money. It was evidently a money-making scheme by the persons starting it. Not too much work was done. The tunnels were deepened somewhat, trying to reach the underground cavern again. And the many millions of dollars waiting for anyone smart enough to get to this underground cavern have lured many, many people to the area. And here's a last look at how will you get there. Highway 91 going to Las Vegas, the mountain pass area, and the little dirt roads going over to the Kessler Peak. You can go right up the side of Kessler Peak and explore the area. It's a very interesting area. And this area has several stories concerning underground caverns, entrances to them. And this, of course, 
was part of an Indian tradition where a person was allowed to go down into the cavern and led by Indians and then later they blew up the entrances. Many, many other interesting stories in this general area. It's not our intention to get into the buried treasure and this aspect in this particular presentation. We'll do this some other time and we point out that there are other areas in the West that are heavy concentrations of phenomena and this particular area, the Four Corners area, is a particular area that we keep mentioning. The bottom we see Socorro and upper middle right we see Taos and Farmington in the center and you'll see the circles with an X in them as suspected ancient tunnel sites and the little pyramids are where UFO occupants have been seen repeatedly and the large black dots are UFO landing sites that have been witnessed time and again in the same areas. The Four Corners area, one of the most fascinating areas in all of the United States. The Indians have traditions of their ancient ancestors coming out of caverns after major earth floods and coming up into this area. And many still feel the caverns are there. We've all heard of the Loch Ness Monster and other various aquatic creatures all throughout the world living in the various lakes. Few persons know of the western monsters and sea serpents though. Few persons hear of the one that's in Hawthorne, California. Lake Walker evidently as a sea serpent that's been seen by several persons living in Hawthorne which is near Lake Walker. And typical is an example in 1956. A couple were driving near the narrow end of the lake and they saw something coming that looked like a small motor-powered boat. When it arrived near them, they could see that it evidently was catching mud hens. And it was a shark-like giant monster almost 45 to 50 feet long according to them. It struck up above the water at least four or five times feeding on the mud hens in the area. Huge. And uh, they weren't the only couple that saw this in the last few years because the Indians have traditions and occasional sightings that are printed in the areas, newspapers. And the residents of Hawthorne are so familiar with the legends that their high school athletic teams there have called themselves the Serpents. And this is the classic sea serpent body. And evidently the serpent in Hawthorne is not of this type. The lake walker creature would be more fish-like. But I'm originally from Idaho, and I remember ever since I was a child about the stories concerning a monster in the Payette Lakes area near McCall, Idaho. And the Payette Lake region is a resort area about 50 miles north of Boise. And there have been a number of vacationers, campers, and fishermen that have sighted this creature. And some have said it resembles a giant snake. Like other phenomena in the West, the lake monster stories can either be taken with a grain of salt or accepted with a more open mind. And considering only a small number of persons tell of unusual sightings, for fear of ridicule, 
probably hear only a tiny fraction of the sightings which actually take place. And what would you do if you saw this scene? Well, now that we've taken a look at many of the vortex areas of the West, let's go a step deeper and try to understand the energies that make the American West a special place. First, it's helpful to realize that when atoms form together to make matter, they always follow a crystalline, geometric shape, depending on the type of energies involved. And each type of crystal and metal has a peculiar structure that is part of the exacting laws of nature. And in every circular form, like Earth, there's an unseen grid work of such energies intertwining to feed the negative and the positive energies for balance. And here you see a map of the etheric energy grid work made up by Russians some years ago. These latest work grids show us that Earth is like a crystal and has certain areas that carry more kinetic energy flow than other areas. Next, if you'll track down the world's tectonic plates, where land masses shear off from one another and the major fault lines lie, and you'll find that they pretty much follow the energy grid lines. This map shows the tectonic plates very clearly. And you can see that there's a major fault line that runs along the west coast, while a minor fault line runs across the southwest and up the east coast. On this map, you can see how the energy grid points are loosely followed by the tectonic plates. And you can also see the way the energy flows in a counterclockwise direction to create sort of a giant vortex area within the energy square surrounding the United States. And the surprising little secret in all this is that virtually all of the high energy people and thinkers who are ahead of the majority in originality and such are near these energy lines. At areas like in Florida and Southern California, there are other energies that impinge on the vortex energies and make what we might call hot spots, which you see in pink on this map. Well, look at this map carefully and you will have some keys to some pretty awesome power. And in other productions, I'll explain how to tap this vortex energy for power. But now I think you're beginning to understand why California and Southern Florida and a few other areas along these flow lines, these energy flow lines are very special. Think about it. We're taught in school that Columbus discovered America, but many other histories and records tell a different story. And the true facts are, there were many bold expeditions that landed eastern and western shores of the United States. These adventurers landed on our shores for thousands of years, in fact. And aside from the Vikings and the Welsh and Basque, Celts and others, they landed on our east coast before Columbus. Even our western states have little known records of visitors. Near Denver, Colorado, for instance, there are caves that were found in the late 70s which had old Celtic inscriptions in them. And other caves in southeastern Colorado and Oklahoma also had Celtic messages in them. There are 60 volumes of records and pictures and maps in Japan that indicated Asiatics were visiting the west coast a couple of thousand years ago. A Chinese missionary discovered a manuscript in 1890 that 
mentioned there was a regular trade between China and the West Coast in the first century. And one record tells of a Chinese Buddhist priest who made a 41 year voyage a few hundred years after Christ died. And this ship was literally loaded with Indian and Aztec goods and logs, details, the West Coast and the tribes of the Americas. This was data that no fakery could produce. Well, the annals of these adventures into Fusang or the Western Americas as we know them is well known to many Asians. Western scholars, however, still ignore this evidence. The Asians recognize their historians put down the facts as they were, and they respect these truths as actual history. Well, I explained earlier how some ancient rock writings attributed to Indians were done long before the recent Indians of North America ever came on the scene. And typical is this example of ancient Atlantean writings done up in Washington State. And they did it with a powdered ruby plastic paint. It's weathered the years very well. And here's a close-up of this chronogram of his known, which Indians claim was made by white men, large stature. And this was according to their own traditions. They don't recognize other Indians doing this work at all. And an ancient language authority named O.L. Opsjohn tells us the writings indicate there was a large planetary fragment that crashed to Earth 20,000 years ago and instantly caused chaos across this planet. And there were many land masses and islands that sank, of course, and volcanoes erupted in some areas and freezing cold quick froze life in others. Well, these unique chronograph writings are near the little Spokane River in Washington State. They're on Indian Trail Road. And their detailed meanings can be found in a book by Health Research of Mokalumni Hill, California. And this is Professor Upjohn showing off some examples of meteors with origins from explosions on the sun. Well, the other forms of rock art usually found in the West are from many, many cultures. And on the Nevada side of Lake Mojave, there are many pictographs like this in Grapevine Canyon there. There have been at least 20,000 or so pictographs scratched or picked on the rocks of the southwest area of the United States, yet very few are representative of the higher cultures that did the chronographs and the deep etchings that we just showed you. The later cultures, like the Indian tribes of the southwest, tended to do drawings like this, which showed men or animals or very simple symbols. And if you'd like to scout out and find the older examples, you should start with the collections cataloged by various museums and archaeological departments. And with James Churchward's books, like the Sacred Symbols of Mu, you can get an idea of what the older symbols look like and represent. The stories of underground caverns and tunnel systems in the West have drifted down from Indian traditions and occasional isolated discoveries for many years now. And in some instances, we can surmise that the strange beings who supposedly live underground are either other dimensional creatures, beings, or beings of very different intelligences. And in the late 1940 Amazing Stories magazine was started a series of stories on underground caverns, and they got hundreds of responses from persons who claimed they had similar experiences. Typical was a druggist from Burley, Idaho, who said there was a cavern entrance 
in his area that was well known to fearful Blackfeet Indians in the area. They wouldn't go near it. He said that he and friends had explored it, but they were so weakened and shaken up and exhausted every time that they got any ways in it that they couldn't continue, had to leave. The locals dynamited the entrance and the rubble mysteriously got cleaned out a few days later each time. To the north of Mountain Pass, the cavern of gold that we discussed earlier, there lies Death Valley. This valley, of course, was once filled with water, according to the traditions and the debris left in the center of the valleys there, the dry lakes. In ancient times, there was an advanced civilization that overlooked this lake, according to the traditions. And there was one book that told of two prospectors discovering the ruins of an ancient city underground in the surrounding mountains overlooking Death Valley. Bork Lee's Death Valley Men book tells of this find and how the entrance was lost due to flash floods in the area. And the entrance area got lost again along with other problems from bad luck and such. There was some later controversy surrounding this book and then an Indian who was raised in the area wrote an article in the spring 1948 Fate magazine. He explained that when the Gulf of California extended into the area that this great culture was a sea trading culture. Later as the Gulf got cut off and the inland seas dried up this great culture developed flying craft and the Paiute Indians and other Indians evidently have traditions of this strange advanced culture. They very seldom speak of, of course, because of the ridicule they run across. But virtually all the Indians in the Four Corners area of the United States have traditions concerning their ancestors coming up to the area through secret underground caverns. Well, the Indians in this Four Corners area evidently had their origins in different areas of the world. When their original homes were evidently destroyed in the great cataclysms, they were led to this new land by spiritual leaders. Then there was a mountain north of Garlac, California called Iron Mountain. It was said to be the home of a dying star race that went underground to avoid the fatal solar rays on this planet. And this was in a UFO annual by Saga Magazine, 1967. And there are many other strange stories of lost inner earth entrances, of course. Many of these were contained in a series of reports by Bruce Walton out of Provo, Utah during the 1980s. Many of these stories aren't substantiated, but we should, while we're covering such exotic trivia, touch on the Mormon record vaults near Salt Lake City. And these vaults on Granite Mountain there contain genealogical records from all over the world. They have a huge staff to microfilm the unending impact of records there. In the upcoming end time cataclysms, these vaults will supposedly assure that the records will remain safe there. One of the great disasters of the West occurred during Teddy Roosevelt's term, and it's hardly even remembered today. And as we pointed out earlier, the Gulf of California once extended up toward Death Valley in the distant past, and as the land built up from the silt 
of the Colorado River, it raised along what is now the Mexican-California border, and it cut off these inland seas. And this map of the 1500s shows the Gulf extending further north, and there have been several accounts of finding Spanish ship hulls caught in the last inland sea, which is now known, of course, as the Salton Sea. And the fact that the river occasionally often spilled over into the Salton Sink in the 1840s and 50s caused minor lakes, and then development companies began to build irrigation canals and build up the area into a farming community. Well, at one point, some careless construction caused the Colorado River to begin pouring down one makeshift ditch after a slight flood caused problems. And this caused the ditch to rapidly deepen and widen out till the water got completely out of hand. And all efforts by local companies to stop this torrent were futile. Well, as you can see by this map and the old ancient beach front rising about twice as large an area as the Salton Sea itself, then you get an idea that there were hundreds of square miles of Imperial Valley farmland that were threatened by this. And after attempts by the local companies through dynamiting and small attempts at filling in this raging torrent with rocks and such, they quickly saw that they were outgunned and they called in the Southern Pacific Railroad. And Southern Pacific acted quickly. They began immediately in 1906 to stop this torrent and they tied up a fortune in their boxcars and freight trains to fill in this torrent with rocks and every available freight car in the western part of the United States was quickly loaded with rock from every quarry that had rock all across the country. And day and night the cars dumped rock into the half mile by 40 foot deep gorge. And they were working against time because as you can see here, there were whole communities washing away while they were working. And at this point, a flash flood washed away the work of one complete season and one train locomotive escaped by seconds as the rock cars behind it dropped into the flood waters. One disaster after another came along and after controlling this larger channel, a later flood opened up another channel and left a river steamer high and dry. Well, the awesome force of the water finally proved too much for the settlers and the railroad, and they gave up for the time being. And then they got a hold of Teddy Roosevelt and the government, and Teddy promised to back the railroad, and they began again. The railroad hired almost 1,500 Indians to weave huge mattresses of brush to dump the rocks on and hold the bottom of the river. The railroad got huge pile drivers to drive in 60-foot piles, and they hunted all over the west for timbers, and they depleted stock after stock. And finally, they got temporary bridges like this in where they dumped the rock in the water in scenes like this. There were 1,000 flat cars dumping rock from quarries all over the western United States. And they worked around the clock. Finally, by a sheer volume of rock, day after day of dumping, week after week after week, Imperial Valley was finally saved thanks to the railroad. And what did the railroad get? Well, instead of almost three million dollars from the government that it was promised, they got nothing. Twenty-four years later, they got a paltry million dollars or so from the government. 
and had not the railroad stuck its neck way out and spent a great deal of money for the settlers in this lowland area, the whole the Imperial Valley would be underwater like Salton City here. Today, Salton City is under the Salton Sea. And this is a rancher in Mecca, fleeing from his home in a boat. And of course, the whole area would be underwater today if it were not for Teddy Roosevelt and the railroad working together. And this is one last map of the Salton Sink. And when you think about there being only about 25 feet between the Gulf of California and all the seawater ready to rush in on the Salton Sea area and Palm Springs area, then you might have some notion of where not to build your little nest below sea level. One good earthquake and a little fault crack would all it would take to renew the gigantic walls of water rushing into this area once more. And there are many psychics, of course, that see this happening before the year 2000 turns. And this early photograph from 1906, August, shows the new Colorado River Canyon formed when the river flooded the desert area near Brawley. Something to think about something the real estate promoters in the area don't like to mention nowadays. And another little saga in the strange history of the West.